Psalm 5. Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may rejoice in you. Let's join together in the prayer of confession. God our Savior, we are sorry for our wrongs. As you have given us awareness of our sins, also give us courage to face you with a good and honest confession. Give us a new resolve to walk in your light. Give us grace that we may not sin. Our assurance of pardon this morning is from Ephesians. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you cannot take credit for it. It is the gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done, so you cannot boast about it. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Put this in a setting, if you will. Our anthem's entitled Hosanna, Hosanna. <clears throat> and if you could visualize <clears throat> the procession <clears throat> coming down the street uh, into Jerusalem, uh, you will hear the folks in the procession strongly, and then you'll hear an echo that <clears throat> pretty much echoes what the procession is saying. So listen to that and put yourself in that setting of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem.
please be seated. And let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we have uh, a number of people that we've mentioned today. We, we continue to pray for, we think of them on our uh, bulletin in our newsletter. We have list of prayer requests and people who need prayer. We think of Wendell and Wynette especially, and uh, we have a number of other people on our list that we, we love, we worry about, we pray for and ask for healing and sustenance and comfort. We think too of the people in Ukraine, God of peace. We pray for them and this terrible war. We were very worried about it because so many, so many of those young 17 and 18 year old soldiers are dying. We think of all the places in this world where there are battles, the six or seven other hot spots, and wherever there are people who are cowering down and who have fear and, and face despair, wherever there is hunger and misery, let your power be and let their change be and let your justice be. Comfort, may comfort be near them and may hope surround them through your providence and by your wisdom, Fill the world leaders with wisdom. We pray for the growth of your church in this world, that peace may abound and hope may abound. And we pray for your growth for your church here in this nation. We pray for this church. Have compassion on those of us who sorrow and who worry, heal sickness, give hope and joy for our congregation for our families, and for those of all of our brothers and sisters, as we pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Philip, 
who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went to ask Jesus. Jesus said, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. Truthfully, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death produces many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it forever. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, for my servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this hour is why I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, <clears throat> I have already brought glory to my name, and I will do so again. When the crowd heard it, some thought it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus said, The voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowd responded, We understood in Scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may wonder why we're not uh, doing the passage of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Every year, pastors look at the east of uh, for Palm Sunday and Easter, and they think they've got to read that passage and then the passage of the moment of the resurrection. But this year, I want to talk about what Jesus said. The first thing he said after Palm Sunday, after he went into Jerusalem, next week on Easter, what Jesus said after the resurrection. Uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And this Bible reading today, that, that's the first thing he taught for weeks uh, before this, Jewish leaders had been plotting and trying to kill Jesus. They sent, had sent word out, the Bible says, uh, if you know where he is, tell us. And uh, if we can judge from some of the actions, uh, especially the action of Judas, the word went out and said, we'll give you a little money if you'll show us where he is. So Jesus stayed away from Jerusalem up till this point. And then something made him go back and expose himself. He knew he would be exposed. What made him go back? Love made him go back. He went back for a friend, Lazarus, in Bethany. That's a town just within sight of Jerusalem. You can look, raise your head up and see Jerusalem. So Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, news of which would spread like wildfire. And and not only that, Jesus acted proactively. He didn't run off and hide. He didn't wait. It was time. He acted proactively. He entered Jerusalem as the Messiah and confronted the leaders. And if you read all that he said between that day, Palm Sunday, and the day that he was crucified, you'll see he said and did everything he could to press all their buttons. He was provocative. He entered Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. 
The people cheered. They believe he was the Messiah. And there were some Greek believers and believers from other Gentile nations who had come to Jerusalem because that was Passover. And people from all over, Jews from all over, would come for Passover. They wanted, and these Greek believers heard about Jesus, they wanted to meet Jesus. And so they made their request made known to Philip. We want to see Jesus, they said. And as I was reading this, I thought, what do we learn about Jesus from his response to the Greek believers saying, we want to see Jesus? <sighs> Number one in your outline is uh, Jesus is accessible. We learn that Jesus is accessible. The Greek believer said, we want to see Jesus. And Jesus answered, uh, he, he didn't say, well, I'm busy this week. He told them why he was there for his death. That's why he was there. And it would be glorious unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies. It's just going to be one grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus was accessible and is accessible to anyone who says, I want to see Jesus. There's an American mission in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, they, their mission is to help homeless kids who sleep on the streets. In Brazil, it is, a, it is a great embarrassment to the country. They're doing what they can about it, but they have millions of children sleeping on the streets of the urban areas in, in Brazil, and especially Sao Paulo. They find boys, this mission finds boys, they, they, the boys have been abused. They survive often by selling their bodies. They're taken advantage of, and they do what they can for them. One uh, missionary said, we, we, we find them, we clean them, we dress them, we give them a home, and we put them in a mission school, and we take them to school. We give them a family, and we take them to church. That, uh, that missionary who said that once was, uh, he goes out early in the morning to find boys, um, you know, in the streets. There are other missions that find girls. But he found a boy sleeping on the sidewalk there in Sao Paulo and he gave him a bag of food. And the boy said, what do you want me to do? Uh, I don't have to tell you what he was thinking. The missionary said, nothing, it's yours. And the boy said, you want me to do dirty things with you? And he said, no, it's all yours. He told the boy that he was an American from, from the Christian mission. And the boy looked up and he said, you're an American. Tell me, is it true that in America it's against the law for parents to beat their children and throw them away? Is that true in America? The missionary knew right then this was the boy he was going to invite to come. And he invited them to come and live at the mission, to go to school and hear about Jesus and at the church. And the boy brightened up and he said, I do, sir, I want to see Jesus. And the missionary saw to it that Jesus was accessible to that boy. The Presbyterian Church in Taguasco, Cuba, hit hard times when Castro brought his revolution to Cuba. Uh, membership went down to one person, and she showed up every Sunday. And then Castro declared there is no God and um, condemned anyone who would go to church. He condemned church going. And that one member opened the church doors every week and let them stand open on Sunday so that everyone could see that God was worshipped in the Presbyterian Church in Taguasco. And it's been 80 years and they have grown slowly. They are, they are up to 30 members now. They're all senior citizens and they, they even started a choir. Uh, oddly enough, they call it the Senior Choir. And they found a pastor who would come and serve them, Dine Escuerdo. And they don't just meet on Sundays, they serve meals to seniors twice a week. 
And they, uh, they, on Saturday, they bring children in for free tutoring in their school subjects, and they give them a good lunch. They reach out to the poorest women in their town. Many are prostitutes. But they don't put up a sign and saying what kind of person can come. Then they ask, when they ask, someone asked them, why do you do it? One of the elders said, we don't, we don't hide Jesus in the church. He is a Jesus of the people and we take him to the people so he will be accessible. Now, number two in your outline, what we see in Jesus' answer is that he is costly. In verse 25, it's where Jesus said, those who love their life uh, in, uh, in this, love their life in this life, they're going to lose it. And in some translations, in the literal translation, it says, those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternity. And uh, uh, everyone's quick to point out that the hate here it's a, it's a phrase in the uh, ancient world, uh, and Jesus used it more than once. It means just to hate your old selfish, greedy life. He's appealing them to turn over that new leaf, to turn to God and lead that new life. Now here's a true story. I'm going to say it's a true story because when I read it, I did not believe it. I looked it up and found where several sources reported it. It's word for word true. There's this oil tycoon back in Texas some years ago, and he said that when I die, I want to parade through town, and I want a burial in the back seat of my gold-plated car. And when he died, the whole town came out for the parade, marching bands, Cadillacs full of politicians, par <coughs> a, a big parade, followed by a chauffeur, 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 there's that French again, it gets me every time followed by a driver in his gold Rolls Royce convertible with a man's body propped up in the back seat setting up with his eyes glued open and a broad smile fixed on him by the funeral home. And as the car drove by, I would have been just, my, I would have been shocked. But a funny thing happened. The people began to cheer. They cheered as he went by, and a large grave was dug, and they all went to the gravesite. They had this crane set up so it would pick up the car straight up, move it over, drop it down into that hole, and bury it. And at that moment, someone in the crowd shouted, Now that's what I call living. <laughs> he should have said, now that's what I call pathetic. Don't cocoon yourself with pathetic treasures in a protective layer of a sense of a false life of success. You may not have succeeded at all, you may have failed miserably. Don't put a protective layer around yourself of false security. With Jesus, there is a cost. If you follow what Jesus who talked about dying in order to bear much fruit, then listen to what he says. What else do we learn about Jesus, about what he said? Number three, Jesus is troubled and here we learn that he's not a stone cold hard piece of rock. He said, now my soul is troubled in the Greek. Now my soul has inner turmoil that you wouldn't believe. Jesus is emotionally distressed. We, he knew the leaders would strike and he would die. And Jesus is not thinking, ah, no problemo amigos. This is, this is par for the course for us messiahs, you know. No, no problem. I'm cool. Meeting death horrified Jesus. In the garden, he, he sweated and he prayed, Father, don't let this happen. 
in the Bible reading, uh, right there after the Palm Sunday, he said, what do I do? Do I say, Father, save me? Do I say, don't let me die? It's what he wanted to do. Save me from this hour? He said, I can't pray that. This is why I came. This hour is why I'm here. So Jesus is not an armored tank, but a human being. Remember, in, in our, our doctrine of the Trinity said he's 100% fully human, and he reflects 100% everything that is God. Remember that in Hebrews it says he is a man in every way that one can be human and he is the image of God himself. He's not an armored tank. He's a human being struggling with conflict of soul and the horror of torture and death and that's not sinful. It's not a lack of faith. It's human and it's not a sin to be human. It's, it's a holy thing to be human, to be built by God. Be sure that no matter what you're going to go through, no matter what it is, no matter how you're feeling right now, Christ knows exactly how you feel. And number four, Christ is conquering. Jesus is conquering. In verse 31, Jesus said, now is the judgment. He's looking at the cross. He's saying, now, here it is. It's the judgment. and Satan's going to be defeated. And the original language, Jesus does not mean literally now today when I die on the cross, judgment's going to just pop up out of the ground. He's saying, with my death, I establish my rule. We say it in the Apostles' Creed. He was crucified, dead, and buried, rose up, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Uh, and he's sitting there at the right hand of God the Father in that throne next to the throne of God. That's the, in the ancient East, that's the, that's the judgment seat. And from that reign, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. The dead will be resurrected for judgment day. So why does he say today, this is the day? This is the judgment. This is the day that Satan is cast into the abyss. This is the day evil ceases to exist. Why does he say that? Because he, does, he says it in this sense. And I thought of a couple of, of examples. You might remember at Gettysburg, one of the com Confederate commanders, I think it was Pickens, said after the battle was over, he said, today the war is over. They all knew it would take a few more battles to wrap it up, but Gettysburg was the turning point. And Jesus was speaking in that sense. On D-Day, you might remember General Eisenhower, after, after the successful one-day event, said, today the war is over. It's won. We won, is what he said. Indeed, we found out just a few months later, it was inevitable. And in that sense, Jesus said, now is the judgment. Evil has had its last hurrah. Salvation and eternal life is inevitable. Inevitable today is the turning point, the turning point in human history. And then we see that Jesus is enlightening. Jesus is enlightening. Verse 34 and 35, that's... Uh, that's when Jesus talked to them about his death when he said the Son of Man will be lifted up. And they understood that. And they heard he was going to die. That confused them because they had uh, one interpretation, uh, one of the major interpretations in their day about the Messiah was that he would reign for eternity. So they, they said, whoa, Jesus, what are you talking about? How can you be lifted up? Isaiah 9, uh, Daniel 7, it says yours will be an everlasting kingdom. So we assumed you'll live forever. You see, they needed enlightenment. They had a misconception. They needed to stop reading about theology and doctrine, which is very helpful to understand the Bible. They needed, to, they needed the experience of walking with Jesus. They had a misconception, but... But see that it's only when they meet Jesus that the light came on. They stop speculating on different theological ideas. I remember back, uh, what year was it? Oh, I forget. 
Steve Jobs introduces the iPad, and I'm looking at this, my son's sitting next to me, and I looked over at my son and I said, John, you mark my words, that iPad is the biggest flop in Apple history. It's not going to sell anything, and nobody's going to buy one unless it has a phone in it. A few years later, I got an iPad. Somebody actually gave me one. I wasn't going to go buy one, because I had to eat my words about the thing being a flop. They bought, they gave me one, and I started using it, and the light came on. My daughter gave me her Prius. When the Prius came out in 1997, I told my wife, that's going to be a big flop, I can guarantee it. Mark my word. The American public does not want to buy a car with a battery in it, a battery to run it. And I, I did the math sometimes. I'd look at it and think, well, should I? Should? No, no, that Prius, no, we're not going to buy it. That's not the car we want. Wow, did I change my mind when I got behind the wheel of that Prius. Just for this sermon today, I checked just one week of uh, my driving this past week. I did uh, 59 miles per gallon. Same's true with my Skechers that I'm wearing. I had to buy some Skechers one time. I didn't have a choice. I wasn't going to buy those Skechers. I told Tim Peters last week that, uh, when I had a firm conviction about Skechers. Silly shoes. They're for sissies. They are. They're for sissies. You're not going to catch me dead with those. I, I, I won't go to... I had to swap some shoes in and they didn't have anything that fit me except those Skechers and they wouldn't give me my money back. So I got mad and bought the Skechers. <laughs> I want to tell you, wow, this is my second pair now. <laughs> I'll pay whatever they've got. To, whatever's on that tag, I'll pay for it. I had to walk... I had to walk with the sketchers to find out for the light to come on. So the people with Jesus misinterpreted Jesus. And you notice it's just an intellectual misinterpretation. And, and look at this. This is so fascinating. Did Jesus answer their objections? Normally you think, yeah, Jesus is going to, you know, he's going to put them straight. No. Did he correct those ideas about him? No. Verse 35, he says, in effect, get behind the wheel and take a test drive and the light will come on. Guarantee it. Verse 35, he said, the light is with you a little longer. That means get with me while you can. Experience me. You're going to see, he said. You will become children of light. All right, perhaps Jesus has not answered all of your objections about him. I dare say that Jesus is saying to you today, don't wait for every doubt to be solved before you give your life to me, but count the cost first. Are you ready? Follow the crucified, resurrected, glorified Jesus, lest darkness overwhelm you. Pray with me. Father, there may be uh, members of this congregation or visitors. There may be those who would say with me right now as I pray, not aloud, but in their hearts silently. They may want to say with me as I'm praying this prayer. I want to be like the Greek believers right now. I 
want to see Jesus. Amen. you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.